introduction should be straightforward and easy because Mr. Kevin Page is something of a legend among young professionals and public servants. I told it to him and he was very modest about it. Actually, what he said was, who are you? Go away. But uh, it's, it's fine. It's fine. I'm just kidding. But um, really, a brief glance at Mr. Page's cred credentials reveals that he is a veteran of many years in the core central agencies of public service, meaning the Treasury Board Secretariat, Finance Canada, Department of Finance, and of course the Privy Council Office. Furthermore, he was also the inaugural holder of the Office of Parliamentary Budget Officer. Now, think about this. When Parliament creates a position for you to fill, that speaks volumes of your skill, of your influence, and of your character. Aside from this, Mr. Page has also cultivated a, uh, a reputation for being a generous leader who is very giving with his time, particular to youth, particularly to youth, and who is very, I would say, tough. I'm not sure if tough is the right word, but Mr. Page has always you know, gotten himself the reputation of someone who is, is not content to be obstructed by bureaucracy and who will not be stopped by you know, uh, uh, layers and layers of approvals to get at the truth or the big important issues. Now, very recently, this set of values and philosophy was manifest in his book called Unaccountable, Truths and Lies on Parliament Hill. So then, without further ado, it is my great pleasure to welcome to the stage, Mesdames et Messieurs, accueillons chaleureusement Mr. Kevin Page. I just use this one. As you wish. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Jack. That was very too nice. Uh, no, thank you. And thank you, Martin, too. That was a great presentation. I agree, you have to marry very well. <clears throat> um, so, I mean, what I'd like to do is on the issue of leadership is talk maybe about three things. Number one, the personal reflections, what does it mean to me? Um, number two, in the context of say maybe the, my you know, experience as the priority budget officer, like you know, what did, you know, you know, what did that experience kind of bring in the context of leadership? And what do we need in the context of leadership, both at the public service and political levels? And I think number three, I'd like to Actually, maybe share some advice that I really like that I got from somebody else um, who writes for the New York Times and has written books on art of character and, and um, David Brooks on really that speaks to the younger generation like, and what, you know, what might be some guiding principles that you might want to think about uh, as you, you know, move forward in your careers. So number one, I would say leadership. First of all, I'd probably, like just for me, leadership is... Um, and I think most of the people that I met, when I say, well, that person's a leader, like, they don't see themselves as leaders. They're like, too busy doing things. And uh, they're just like, they're so in the present that the idea that you said, well, you're a leader, they would like, no, I'm not. And I'm just trying to get something done. And, um, but I think most of the people that I've met, and this is all different fields, really, in uh, you know, business and public service, arts, um, volunteer work they I think they need to be motivated they are motivated and it's about a higher purpose for them it's not about uh, usually it's not about money though in some cases it looks to me like Donald Trump is motivated by money <laughs> and fame but you know I think often that you know there those great leaders for me that I look at say in my lifetime like political leaders you know um, um, Mandela been to South Africa a few times you know, Mr. Gandhi, you know, in, in India, you know, leaders in the scientific fields. We have one just, you know, Canadian got a Nobel Prize in physics. Um, you know, even, you know, like Martin was talking about hockey players, Bobby Orr, I've met Bobby Orr. None of them would actually say that, I don't think they would say that, yeah, I'm a leader. It's just like they were too busy fixing apartheid, too busy fixing a country, too busy trying to understand how the universe is too put together, too busy having fun on a, on a hockey rink um, to think about it. But they were really motivated. 
they passionate, and they just, because they found that something that really makes them tick, which is really important. And they were really, I think, when you look at those people, they're actually, they're all themselves. Like, they're not carbon copies uh, of somebody else. So if leadership for me, again, maybe it's, it's you know, it'll come up in QZ. Leadership, number one, for me, is about vision. Number two, it's about making change happen. And number three, it's about the values, I think, that Martin talked about. So you need vision. And uh, a country needs vision. You know, public service needs vision. And vision is really is like looking forward, what's going to happen five or 10 years down the road? What is, are those forces that are going to shape? And how do we get ahead of some of that? You know, that, how do we bring about some of that change? And like, if you think about, read the newspaper today, and we've you know, got leaders moving to a, you know, a, you know, Paris. You know, one of these a COP21 meetings to kind of talk about climate change. Or we have, you know, premiers meeting and there'll be meetings on health care um, and there'll be meetings on the economy and getting infrastructure out the door, you know, to fix cities, et cetera. So what is the vision of our, our country's leaders, you know, to actually solve some of those problems? Like how do we, you know, how do we reduce our carbon footprint? Like how do we, you know, we're aging demographics, we're gonna see the significant changes in our demographics over the next two decades. Like how do we deal with long-term care? How do we deal with reducing drug costs? How do we make sure that we have a healthcare system in place for you folks uh, after people like me kind of, you know, um, take a lot of energy and money out of that system? So what's the vision? Like, what does our economy look like without this footprint? Like, how do we become a knowledge-based kind of economy? So you need to hear it from the leaders. This is what I see Canada being in 20, 30 years from now. And then, it, that's one thing. You know, often you don't hear that. People are afraid to say, you know, what this economy looks like if you reduce the carbon footprint. And they'll say, oh my God, it's going to be terrible. You know, because we're going to spend so much more on, uh, on, you know, reducing these greenhouse gas emissions is going to kill the economy. But how do you bring about the change once you know that change is necessary? How do you bring those people together? What is the evidence that you put on the table? What are the lines, the messages that you make that bring about leaders? Like, how did Mandela do it? Like, how did Gandhi do it in those amazing countries and unbelievable circumstances? You know, biggest unbelievable things that I've seen like in my lifetime. But I think one of the things I think most people, like leaders, you know, it's very important to have is like, those values. Like people need to know what you stand for and that you stand for it all the time. So what are those values that you find that are unique that, make, that could make you a personal leader? Um, you know, there's a, some of it is competence, right? You know, like you know, in public service charters, they talk about merit-based and things. You want people that are competent, that are well-trained and educated. There has to be integrity. Has to go with that competence. Has to have it. Has to be there all the time, so you're never second guess guessing somebody you work for. Um, you know, there has to be a little bit of courage sometimes. You know, I think you think about we have a new government, and you know they had a big platform, something like 184 initiatives according to the Trudeau meter. You know, you're going to change, bring back accountability and transparency, costing and all these initiatives. Things are going to affect you folks on a daily, weekly basis. Um, you know, big plans to get money out the door and in infrastructure programs, uh, and um, you know, change childcare programs. Like that is, you know, that's, you know, to, to deliver that is going to be a significant challenge. So. Like, we, you know, you want to be, get behind, you need to have vision and all those things. We need to know where he's going to go. And then the integrity part is like, you'll know every time that this is, you know, once you say, I'm going to be transparent, I'm going to be accountable on every initiative. Like, I'm looking for that. Fiscal update last Friday, I'm looking at this document, I'm saying, that's not really any different. And that's not like more transparent, like, you know, oil prices are changing. Maybe there should have been a bit more analysis around, you know, what's happening to oil prices, how that impacts their economy, how, and, you know, so announcements today, I guess, on refugees. You know, we're going to spend, you know, six, seven hundred million more over the, over the medium term. Well, is that a right number? I don't know. Where was, the, where was the analysis? The government promised this stuff. So like the integrity part is like that expression, cement dries quickly. You have to be there all the time. I promised you there's going to be something more open and transparent. Are you going to be there? And there's the courage part, because you're going to make mistakes. 
You know, you're going to try to bring in 25,000 refugees over a short period of time. There will be mistakes. You know, you try to get, you know, double the amount of money the federal government spends in infrastructure, there might be some crappy programs. You know, but you're trying to achieve these, you know, significant things. So there's a certain amount of courage that goes through that. The PBO experience. And, you know, the writing that book, Unaccountable, uh, to be honest, I wrote the book for this generation. There's no money in writing a book. None. Maybe two bucks an hour max. <laughs> Maybe less than two bucks an hour. So why do you write it? You know, it was an experience. I actually, some professors that I had bumped into at different things while I was PBO said, you got to write it. And um, you just need to write it down. What was it like to build this new institution that was supposed to be about a transparency and accountability, bring financial analysis you know, to members of parliament? Like, what was that experience like? What did you find? So, actually, my, a publisher, the Penguin, the publisher sent me a review today. It was from the Literary Review of Canada. First time I saw it, just a few hours ago. Read it really quickly you know, on my telephone. And actually, at least the, the, the person got it right. She said, really, this, he wasn't so much going, this originally isn't a story about Kevin versus the government. It was really about, a big part of it anyways was Kevin and the public service. That's who I wrote the book for. The last chapter is really all in the public service. You don't get rich writing a book about the public service. You know, write about vampires, <laughs> Martians, uh, you'll make a huge amount of money. But you won't write a book writing about public service and account, you know, accountability. Not going to be a huge seller at Christmas time. Um, but I think in the book, like, there's, like in terms of the experience and leadership, yeah, you're given a job. Okay, build something new for the country. So day one, you know, you decide right away, are you going to be useful or useless? Which is a question, actually. It's in the book. It was written. MP said to me, like, first interview, you know, are you going to be useful or useless? Because we got a lot of useless. And useful, let's talk about useful. Useful means I got to see stuff I don't get to see. I got to get it in a timely basis. And I remember that as a moment, like kind of an epiphany moment. Well, useful is like hard. Like, you know, you got a small budget and you had this massive mandate. This is going to be a real struggle to be useful. And, you know, especially when under the Act of Parliament, like he worked at pleasure for the prime minister. He could just say bye, you know, the first couple of reports. So, yeah, so if you're trying to build a team that's going to fulfill the function of being useful in this environment. And in a broader environment, I think where we're becoming less and less transparent, on, certainly on financial issues. And we were never. To what you do. The government house leader said that to me. Since no, I mean, maybe a couple of people, maybe you know, Mr. McCallum because he was a former chief economist, maybe Senator Siegel because he's kind of geeky, um, but nobody's really going to care, nobody's really going to read the stuff, there'll be just no interest. So you're sitting down there and thinking like this is even before you really hired young people like yourself and start to build this office like, wow, like nobody cares? 
This is the primary responsibility of Parliament is to hold the executive to account. Like the power of the purse rests with the House of Commons. Their job is, you know, is to ensure that you know they know where these authority, how these authorities are being used, and that they're being used for the right purposes. They need information, and they don't care. I mean, have we got to the point where we can't communicate why this is so important? You know, is the system that broken? I guess the answer is yes. I think it was that broken, completely broken. And I think Martin, like you could tell when Martin started talking about the submarines, he got fired up. He knew what he was talking about. He knew the bigger picture, which is the visionary picture. So like when you're, like a, if you're a parliamentary budget officer and you're costing a war or fighter plane or crime bills, changes to old age security, there's always a bigger picture. There's your finance angle, but there's the bigger picture. You know, on the war, like if you're putting numbers on boots on the ground and capital and death and disability, like you're asking what kind of military do you want to have at the end of this engagement? Are you going to put the money back in? You're asking, are you going to take care of soldiers that have post-traumatic stress? Like you don't get to communicate it when you're, you know, you're in front of a finance committee or whatever committee, but that is really, that's the bigger picture. That's the visionary part of the organization. Or when you're costing Aboriginal educational infrastructure, you're basically saying, like, why are we treating this kid differently than that kid when we have these responsibilities? When you're costing a fighter plane, you're asking, like, why are we paying so much for stealth and for a fighter plane that's less fast than other fighter planes? When you're costing, you know, changes to old age security, you're saying, like, you know, I, I get that we're, you know, maybe we can work longer, but maybe it's not the same for everybody. What are the other options? Like, you know, my dad was a machinist. Like, at 65, he was worn out. He was shoveling potash in Thunder Bay in a boxcar. He needs to go at 65. I'm 65. I'm just getting warmed up. And I've been sitting on my whatevers for years. Like, I'm just, like, I'm not in harm's way at all. And I don't even do CrossFit. <laughs> but I do run with my dog every morning, almost at the same time. So there's this visionary part about the being the big thing. There's the visionary part of saying, okay, the, I have an, you have an opportunity to bring about change, that the opportunity is there. Can you see it? Are you willing to take it? That's the courage part. And you all have all these opportunities. And the book is really about, I think we're in a bad state in the public service right now. This last government, and maybe even previous governments, was not good for the public service. We stopped doing the work. And I know we stopped doing it because I was responsible for doing it for decades. I knew on the other side of the fence that we, wouldn't, we didn't cost that war. That the Prime Minister wasn't briefed. And why did I know? Because I was his assistant secretary. He wasn't briefed. I kind of knew how he was being briefed on the fighter plane. I knew that we weren't doing sustainability analysis, you know, dealing so that we could analyze old age security changes to Canada health transfer. We didn't even do the effing work. Now, how good is that? That's finance. And that is important. It's not the whole issue. It's not saying this is the priorities for the country. These are the policy directions. But there's a cost to pay when you send people to war. When you tell people you can incarcerate people and, you know, more and it doesn't have any cost, there's no debate. Parliament shuts down. You could have a big debate. You could spend money on incarceration, or you could spend it on mental health. You could spend it on drug facilities to help people. You could spend it on Aboriginal schools. A lot of those kids end up in, in trouble. They don't have the same beginning that a lot of you folks had, right? You shut down debate. Finance is so important. Again, that's the visionary part of stepping back and say, can I see the bigger picture? And then, so you get an opportunity to run an office, and you want to have smart people like you leaders here today. And the, the thoroughbed, you know, to use the expression somebody else used in my office. Like, you've got to give them challenges. You've got to tell them, we can't cost the war. And they're going to come back and say, well, we've never done it before. That's why we're going to do it. And they say, well, how do I do it? I, say, I would say, I don't know. But we, can, we know other people have done it before. They do it, they do, they've done it in Australia. They've done it in Washington. The U.S. has wars all the time. They're always have, you know, they're spending money on planes and ships. We'll just talk to them a lot. You'll find somebody, you know, when they say, at, you know, at correctional services, I'm sorry, we can't give you any costings, you know, on these crime bills. You just say, fine, I'll go to the provinces. They run correctional services facilities. 
There's a way to do it in an information age. So finally then, so the, my advice to, you know, I'm now a professor at the University of Ottawa. I love the job, love being with students. One of my students, James Goh, is here today, great leader. I think he'll be a future prime minister. I'd be betting on it right now, uh, University of Ottawa. Um, but there's the advice I get from this, one of my favorite writers, David Brooks, New York Times. He wrote he, he, different books, he writes weekly columns, and he, he wrote this one piece that really talks like your generation, the, the aspiring leader generation. He said three pieces of advice. Number one, he says, like when you get your first jobs, and I've got kids that are doing this right now, it's the same advice I give to them, you align yourself to a practitioner. You go find yourself, if you're in a new shop, you're in an audit shop, you're in a finance shop, you're in a policy shop, you start looking around, okay, who can I learn from here? You seek out this person. Who's the expert? Who's done it before? Who's made the mistakes? Who do I feel, con like, I could work, I could learn from this person. You know, if you're somebody like me that's now, that later in life I was hiring bosses like that, I would, you know, I'm hiring people based on their ability to attract other people and teach those other people. And, you know, and so that you, know, that you have that kind of capacity. People want, you, you want to draw in talent in your organization, which is also part of leadership. So align yourself with experts, people that have done it before. So I, give the, I promise you, I give the same. Travel the world, it changes you immediately. And then you can actually, when you come back, you love to come back because you love the diversity we have here in this country. And finally, he said, David Brooks said, be stubborn on principle. That you, once you set your values, if you are about integrity, you're going to want to be courageous and take on different, you know, difficult files. You know, if you're about growth, wherever that growth means for you, it's personal or not, like you don't sacrifice your values. He says, you say no a hundred times. No, I can't do that. That wouldn't be right. I can't do that. And if you have to, you move, you find another job. And if you do that, then, you know, you could look at yourself in the mirror a little bit. And it's hard if you have a face like mine. <laughs> but you could say, you know what? Ah, that's okay. It didn't go. I didn't get a good performance appraisal. You know, it's the funny thing, even as, as a PBO, my life, own life experience, it's in the book so I can tell the story. You have to buy the book. Maybe I won't tell the story. <laughs> but you know, when I was at PCO, at Privy Council Office, we had this terrible accident in my family. I lost a son. I had two very bad performance appraisals. Didn't even get fully satisfactory. You know, the clerk says basically, you know, we need to get somebody younger. You know, and I was the assistant secretary of macro policy. We're doing the same kind of work, even to some of the same people that were on my PBO team were there. I'm saying, okay, I get it. I'm out of here. I'm gone. A few years later, same work, same type of analysis, same people even working for me. Like, your people are throwing awards at you. Nothing changed. Didn't change my values. Like, we're still the same, worked with the same people that I love to work with, analytical. 
You know, one camp says, yeah, I don't think you're very good. Other camp says, well, you're amazing. We could give you an award. So maybe it's kind of somewhere in between. Um, but you don't change your values. That kind of gets you through the hard times, right? Um, Warren Buffett, tough times don't last, but tough people too. And leaders have to be tough, right? I think Martin talked about that. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, let's let you know that a donation will be made on your behalf. Thank you. As well. And do we have questions? Go ahead. Hi, thank you for the presentation. Um, I have a question. I guess a technical term would be how to manage change management, I guess. So from different audit, um, when we look at new system implementation, new program, restructuring of our organization, one of the most sensitive piece I'm finding is the culture. How do we how do we influence that? So as a strong leader, I should mention tough time don't last, but tough leader does. Um, how do, as a leader, you see the value, see the um, big picture, but how do you ensure that your employees or your staff, your team sees it as well, and that you guys will push together through that thunderstorm before you've even seen the beam of lights at the end of the tunnel, because sometimes that thunderstorm period is just indefinite sometimes, depending on change. Mm. Thank you. Well, I mean, change is a constant, right? Like, it never stops. It's not like, you know, there's no real stability. There's always things to make better. In some cases, like on big files, they're, it's, they're very challenging. It's going to be really challenging for, our, say, a prime minister to you know, this, this meeting in Paris and to, you know, within 90 days to have a plan, a climate change plan for Canada, and then get businesses as an example behind it. Um, like, I think, for, if, again, back to the leadership issue, it starts, like, even on, you know, on, on, I think people in your shop or your, your, the people that you work with need to know why you're doing what you do. So it has to be really clear. And why are you picking this project? So in the case of the Parmenty Budget Office experience, it's like, why are we costing a war? Why are we doing this crime bill? Why aren't we doing private member bills? Like, why are we taking on these issues, sustainability issues? They have to know that. You have to be able to talk to them. Um, because then they get behind it. You've got to make sure everybody's behind it before you even set out. Because they will get difficult if you're taking on a difficult issue, an audit issue, where you know, obviously mistakes have been made and, and people will be upset. And then, and I think as Martin says, you have to give everybody the cover that they need. Like you have to, if you're working with younger people, or you, know, you have to help them, mentor them, make sure they know this is the product that we want. You know, make make sure that they get the information, the resources they need to do their work, so that it's the very best product. And um, that's really important. Like if you, because this is the best we can do, and you haven't sold your valleys when you do it. <laughs> And then, as again, Martin said, like you, that part of giving them cover is um, that you're responsible. The leader is responsible and accountable. You know, so you, that's you. You're the face of that organization. You, if you're whether.
financial uh, agents. And everybody's talking about development of skills, soft skills to be precise. What is the one recommendation you would have for the people in the room to try to develop over the next few years in their career to be able to stand above the crowd, the rest of the crowd? Hmm. Yeah. Um. No, no, I'm just thinking about. No, no, I like the question. I remember the advice I got from one of my bosses. I had many great bosses. And um, one of them was Alex Himmelfarb. He was a clerk. I worked for him briefly. And he used to say, you know, and he talked about soft skills. He said, you know, you need to bring humanity, your humanity to the office. And it was a way of saying, like, we're all people. Like, don't treat us like robots. Like Martin talked about it, treat us like human beings, as individuals. Um, you know, honestly, I love the people I work with. Like, I think like a lot of that, you know, public service hierarchy stuff is just bullshit. <laughs> you know, you, this is the reporting command. This is the way it goes. Like, you, you don't. Office doors are open. Come on in. Let's talk about it if there's a problem. I canceled meetings at PBO for five years. We had no meetings. We had two meetings and I got in trouble in both of them. <laughs> the people were mad and everybody teamed up against me said, I'm not having any more of those meetings. Now, no, but I'm even being more serious, just bringing her humanity to the office. That's, we want to be treated like people. We want to connect. And that's how you bring, that's, you know, Martin said, that's part of leadership too. Humanity. So I guess, I guess you can figure out my question, but are leaders born or made? Yeah. Yeah. This is nasty. <laughs> I think they're more made than born. Um, yeah, it's, and I think there's, like back to Brooks, The Art of Character, his book, it, there's a formation story of most leaders. And you know, a lot of people read you know, biographies, autobiographies, just to figure out what was that formation story? How did they get there? You know, so like, how did Mandela get to be Mandela when we knew about Mandela? And what was Gandhi's story? And, or what was that you know, Dr. Suzuki story? We had Dr. Suzuki at the, the University of Ottawa a few weeks back to talk about science and the government. So I think it, there, you know, a lot of it is being, it's made over time. And stuff rubs off. There's, again, I mean, part of that advice from David Brooks is like, align yourself to people that you like, uh, that you just feel comfortable. They can teach you stuff in that sense of like. And um, like, don't you, you bring your own values to the organization. You are, you are. You can't change. Don't be somebody you're not. Be authentic. And um, yeah, I think they're made though, over time, with experience. So again. I like experience. I, I, mean, I like youth and energy that comes with youth. But you know, if I'm building a shop, I want somebody there that's you know made mistakes. Just that's life. Like I always assume that you know every forecast we put out is you know in the forecasting business or cost projections they're wrong. Like I don't ever think like you can predict the future. So you have to convince people. You need them to understand what are those assumptions behind it. And um, what's the uncertainty around these estimates? So that they have a sense that when they're planning and they're setting a priority or policy direction, it's a richer planning environment. Sorry. Thank you so much for taking the time to be here with us today. Uh, I have a question for you. Uh, looking back in your career and starting from Thunder Bay, what was the most defining moment in your career, in your opinion? Well. I don't know if there's one, but I think I was very fortunate, as you folks would be, to work with, you know, I knew when I was working with somebody that I really, like I was learning a lot from. Very, it was just lucky that my first boss was Munir Sheikh, and as it was an analytical shop at finance, I was the inflation analyst and the forecaster, and you see, work with this fellow that was extremely intelligent, and he's like, you know, a lot, a lot of red ink on my notes, and helping me, teaching me how to build things, and also the integrity. And you know, I go all the way back to this is like 1980 timeframes, but it just like, 
okay, we're producing quarterly reports, what are you gonna produce this report? And it's gotta go public. Everything was like being released, so I mean, it's just, I see the difference, even in an internet age where we stopped producing these reports in the last little while. So I think all along the line, I had these great bosses, David Dodgers, another one, Scott Clark, Pete DeVries, uh, Alex Himmelfarb, you know, even Sammy Watson learned a lot. He was fearless uh, from these various leaders. But you know, some of them are like, back to Martin's point, are personal. Like, I think for me, they was losing a son. That's just like the, the, the prospect of in human life of bearing your own son and then saying, what's important after that? Like, that is life changing. You just don't care anymore. Like, you want my pension here? I don't need it anymore. I don't need it. It's not worth it. I'm not selling my, you know, whatever, integrity for a pension now. It's life changing. But so, you don't want to have to have suffered to that degree. A lot of people do. That's why I love Canada now, our image of bringing Syrians back in. These are people that have suffered massive losses. Welcome them with open arms. Back to Himmelfarb, show us the humanity of this country. Beautiful, that is like amazing leadership and values. Yeah, you know what, maybe you know, 25,000, we don't get there till February, who cares? Keep trying. <coughs> So yeah, lots of experiences, great bosses, tough projects, getting lots of help. Um, yeah, but sometimes they're even like, you know, like Martin says, some you're just experiences you get that are not necessarily defining pivotal moments, but like, you know, just working with kids. You know, I could be in a, in, a, in a volunteer environment, you know, taking up a volunteer cause. I'm sure lots of you folks are involved in volunteer activities. Being around those kind of people, I'm gonna be speaking tomorrow night at an Ecology Canada meeting. 500 people, little organization that just networks. And at the end of the day, it's all about, you know, let's get you know, it's better streets, clean up the rivers, plant some trees, you know, and it's the people, are, they just do it because they love doing it and they want a better community, they get together, it's a fundraiser tomorrow night. Um, that's leadership. That's defining, when you're around those people, it just kind of rubs off. Hello, I'm one of the students from the University of Ottawa. So I'm just, <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just wondering when you were at our age as a university student, how did you view yourself in the next few decades? And now as you look back on your journey, like how do you feel? Wow. Yeah. That's a long time ago. <laughs> yeah. No, I remember, I was inspired. Like I look, yeah, there were people at the university I was at that were famous economists that you know, back in the late, in the 70s, were writing constantly. Like, and, you know, these, I was at Queens for a period of time and it was like Lipsy and Purvis and Sparks, and Harris, they were putting out all these papers, they were writing in the Financial Post, they were just so engaged. And then they were, you know, working on papers, spending time with students, so um, I always thought like, wow, that, that, we need, that's a good thing to have. And I actually, you know, I, I worry that maybe our, you know, our university community is not as connected as it needs to be on these big issues. Again, environment, healthcare, innovation, science, et cetera. And we need to get them more involved in the, there are involved, but I think we could be more involved. I'm scared to plan about the future now. I think actually some of it is after I lost a son, I don't even want to know where I'm at tomorrow. Um, and I, but I, so I don't think that far ahead. I don't know if that's a problem or not. I think, like, actually, I was raised a Catholic. I'm Buddhist now. Like, you give me something to get me focused on the present. So I'm here with you folks right now. I just want to be with you folks. Like, I'll be with somebody else tomorrow night or whatever, that kind of stuff. So get as much out of this experience as you can in the current. I just feel like I'm happier uh, when I think in those kinds of terms. So I don't really think along. But in terms of career, that was an earlier question. I think you kind of know, okay, this is where I am. This is where I want to be. I mean, I was kind of an economist, macroeconomist type, so I wanted to work in certain organizations. You can, in the government, one of the beauties of the government is you can move around. You know, you could spend time at finance, and I went to PCO, and the treasury, and it's a couple of line departments, and come back to these central agencies. So you get to see everything from different perspectives. And you build a network over time, which can be very, very good for your career over time. And that is actually, and you know, that is good. I mean, you were not out there all the time saying, I, you know, I want to be friends with this guy because he can help me in my careers. I just want to know. And I think with the people at PBO, back to the courage part, like if the, what we sold to them was not job security. We didn't sell like pensions. We said, you know what? You're going to put your name 
on a piece of paper that's going to be really important. It would be important for Parliament. It would be important for your country. When you leave here, you will have tools that you never had and you're unlikely to get anywhere else because you have costed a war or a crime bill or old age security. You wouldn't do that at finance. But you'll do it here and your names go on it. And it's important. And I would ex if you can't understand, I will explain to you why it's important. So, yeah. It's hard to plan the future. Right? Kane said it's, the future's not uncertain, it's unknowable. All right, so, um, but yeah, values. Values will guide you through the future. Hi, my name is Adriana Koptinska. I'm not a financial analyst, but I work as a policy analyst at ESDC. And you talked a lot about change today. So I have two questions. I hope you don't mind. The first is I'd like to hear your thoughts about how you think the change in government will affect the public service. And two, as young public servants, how can we influence change when ourselves, we don't always hold positions that will allow us to make that change and it seems that down the line some of that vision does get lost. Yeah. So. Well, we need to change. We got it in the election. And um, you could see it in the polling numbers. Overall, we went from 60 to 68 percent. And you could see the way it was divided up, you know, between opposition parties in the previous session of parliament and that. So, you know, my personal th observations on that is that, and it's not a conservative kind of observation, it's not a partisan politics thing, but I did not like the direction of the previous government. I can say that now. <laughs> <laughs> I did not like it, and it wasn't tone. Tone is not changing electoral laws for the worse. Tone is not ramming omnibus bills in through the worse, undermining parliament. Tone is not contempt of parliament charges in 2011. That's not tone. You know, and tone is not telling scientists they can't speak up and do their work. So that's way beyond tone. And that's not even conservative. There's nothing conservative about that. There's nothing conservative about uh, not a climate change or fixing healthcare or you know, making a transition from a resource base to an innovation economy. Conservatives can do that as well as liberals or NDP or even Green Party. So I'm probably not gonna get a Christmas card from the Prime Minister. <laughs> but you know, I'm a public, if I'm a public servant now, and I'm, you know, again, back to the book, you seize an opportunity. You just jump at it. You know, you, I'm, I thank Prime Minister Harper for doing a lousy job. <laughs> I thank him. He created context where we can fix things now. <laughs> you know, right away, all of a sudden, we bring back the census and it's like light shines. <laughs> you know, we tell scientists, speak up. Mandate letters, we're publishing them. This government hasn't even done anything substantive yet, the Syrian issue aside, all of a sudden there's light. Premiers are meeting. We didn't have a meeting with premiers since 2009. That's light, you know. So, again, that's not the priority budget officer speaking. That's, you know, me speaking. Yeah, but as the public service, if I'm a deputy, I'm saying, I'm jumping on this. We will show you transparency and analysis you've never seen before. You know, if you give me an opening to do costing, I will show you costings that you've never, an analysis that you, 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 you love to see that generates debate and discourse for MPs. You know, I never bought that issue that MPs are, you can't give them the stuff because they don't understand it. That's never been my experience. I always wish we got a richer debate, but you know what, I think, you know, and, but for the most part, they get it. They're smart people. We give them that information, everything gets better. We start getting debate on it's this war, that war, this fighter plane, that fighter plane, capital budgets for D&D, um, you know, real issues around, you know, reducing crime rates in the future, making our streets more you know, safer, helping Aboriginal people get good educations, all that stuff, fixing pension systems for the future. So I'd be jumping on the opportunity if I was a leader. And if these current deputy ministers don't do it, they should be fired. That's my sense. Because you have a historic opportunity now, the government is saying with that platform, you just jump all over it. 
You should be able to move. That's why already I look for these tea leaves, the last fiscal update. I'm disappointed. That's not as good as the Slovak Republic. That's, and I'm not demeaning the Slovak Republic. We have years to get to the Slovak Republic in terms of transparency and fiscal updates. You know, analysis of these deficits, are they cyclical or structural? Intergeneration analysis on, the, on, the, on these over the medium and long term, you know, sustainability analysis. They have that in their documents. Estimates of liabilities, their environmental, that's already in their documents. We are, it will take us three hard years to get to the Slovak Republic now. We've lost ground. Um, so I'd jump on it. I think for you folks in this room, you are the leaders. Like you will be the leaders. And if, this, if, the, if the group above you, you push them out. You push them. You let them know, I'm coming right behind you. You're not doing the job. This is not the mandate. And so you stay educated. Well, you make sure every product that you do is the best that you can do. And if you're working for a boss you don't like, well, it's the public service. There's 300,000 of us, you move. You find another job. Yeah, and I just think he would be happier. You know what? The country needs a strong public service. You know, when Munir Sheikh resigned, like that was a signal. Your chief statistician of a country on an issue of a long-form census, there's like details around that issue, like in terms of Wait, all of a sudden you're setting up omnibus bills. Hey, I can't do that. You know, when I'm talking to the clerk of the Privy Council in 2012 you know, on this issues of the spending plans, now we're going, we're going to freeze departments for five years and there's no impact? Well, I didn't work in any departments that worked like that. How do you freeze? And, and I'm saying, where's the plans? I can't give them to you. No, give them to Parliament. Don't give them to me. I'll get them from Parliament. No, I can't give them to you. How do you not give them? You're getting performance. And I apologize for my generation. I apologize. Because our handoff to you is terrible. So we have to fix it. You have to fix it. I will help you fix it. Others will help you fix it. But you have to be bold. You have to be. So how are we going to fix climate change? How are we going to fix your health care system? How are we going to make sure that you have pensions for you and your kids? in this world of fundamentally changing aging demographics. Fundamentally different. Five to one right now. You know, from 15 to 65, 65 and over. Going to two and a half to one. How does that not impact your country in 20 years? I'll be gone in 20 years, but you'll still be in prime time in your career. And what is that going to look like? Where are those revenues going to look like? What do you want our cities to look like? These are all great issues. Like you should be thankful you have all these problems. Thank you, Prime Minister Harper. <laughs> <laughs>